I looked at coffee grounds from five different grinder burrs under a powerful microscope at the University of Hertfordshire because I had a hypothesis. The shape of the grinds is the most important thing. I've tested a lot of grinders and grinder burrs, and I wanted to find out more about how the geometry of the grinder burrs influences flavor. And the images that I got are seriously cool and totally changed my opinion about coffee grinders forever. Oh, that's so cool. That is unbelievable. That's kind of hard to believe. It just makes you think like we actually don't see the world how it is at all. Unbelievable, that's like the weirdest thing I've ever seen. That's a coffee particle. This is gonna be a complicated video. So if you appreciate me doing deep dives like this, please press the like button and share this with your espresso nerd friends. And if you wanna support me more directly, you can buy a brew ledger on Amazon. It's an espresso journal I designed to help you dial in faster and stop wasting coffee beans. There's a link in the description with more information. So when I looked at these particles under a microscope, part of me expected to see more elementary shapes like triangles and spheres. And there were definitely some things that looked a little bit like that, but man, I was way off about the variety of grinds coming out of each of the grinders I tested. I brought samples with me from the V6 Multipurpose and Hypernova flat burrs, and also their conical burrs, the Matza Philos with Lebru Lab Sweet burrs, and the DF83V with SSP High Uniformity burrs. All of them make amazing espresso, but you can definitely taste the difference between them if you try them side by side. But why? Whether it's more sweetness, clarity, acidity, more warm or sharp, just more texture, the burrs are a really huge influence. And from what I can tell from talking with lots of manufacturers and from my own experience of testing dozens of these now, a lot of burr design is educated guesswork. So then how do you select burrs and understand what kinds of flavors you should expect to get from them when there's so much marketing coming at you telling you that these burrs or those burrs just taste better? I'm not gonna pepper this video with disclaimers saying we don't know but. So just assume that a lot of this is educated and best info, but it's really hard to verify objectively because everything's so complicated when things get this small. So everything in this video is caveated. At first, I checked the particle distribution with the Litsizer DIA 500 machine, which actually even takes photos of the edges of the particles so you can see their shapes, and it gives you a highly accurate particle size graph like this. I did it, yeah. I successfully did it. a live video of what's actually going down the shoe. This is just a snapshot of like the particles. It's agglomeration, yeah. Yeah, you can see them there and then you have the actual graph with like how... Like it's like a particle distribution. So that's the report that comes out. So Let's look at the mean size. We look at the mean size, we go down and it's 164 wow. micrometers is the mean size of each particle. Uh, I love this so much. This is like the nerdiest thing ever. I love it. Now, can you tell what the taste of the coffee is supposed to be like from a particle distribution graph? Absolutely not, and anyone who thinks they can is full of it. But the fascinating thing was taking it to the high-powered VHX7000 microscope and seeing that particle distribution more visually. I feel like I'm looking into the quantum realm like right now. And then I'll show you the detail on the actual particle. Right, so this wow. is, so if you look at this over here, what in your head is like really fine, this is how, how that is in reality. Yeah, look at that, that's really cool. And um, what we might be able to do is we might be able to play around with lighting to see. Yeah, that's a good idea. The mix, oh, that looks cool. That looks like, <gasps> wait, wait, stay on that, stay on that. Oh, that's so cool. That is unbelievable. That's like my screensaver forever. That's, that's kind of hard to believe. And then look at the layers when you go through. Look at that. Completely different from the previous one, which had much more like random shapes, and this is much more like almost like boulders. So, my initial hypothesis was overly simplistic. Like when you look at sand on a beach, it looks like yellow dots, but under a microscope, it's stars and random shapes and grainy bits and smooth bits. Your eyes just can't figure that out because it's too small. It just makes you think like we actually don't see the world how it is at all. <laughs> what was really cool was how irregular the shapes were, and so how much increased surface area there was in shapes that looked, frankly, like a grinder blade couldn't have possibly produced them at all. The shapes are very different, almost like islands in the ocean or something. So then what I realized is that the cutting blades of the grinder burrs aren't really cutting at all. It seems like what they're doing is not, it's like partly, it's like scratching, it's almost like abrasing yeah. the, the surface. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time as well, it's like 
crushing it so that it's like smashing into random particle sizes. Look at these jagged edges in the relief image of the Lab Suite grinds from the mats of Philos. It's almost like a rusty blade scratched them into a whole other geometry. The surface area is huge compared to a typical more rounded particle like this one from the VS6 Hypernova flat burrs. And it's just between like here and here. Correct. It's like that's 10 point. 10 millimeters. Yeah, so that's very, very small. But then there's also this which across is, like yeah, exactly, exactly. How crazy is that? So my hypothesis that it was more like rounds versus flats seems to have been wildly incorrect. The particles are more like smashed avocado and any cutting and shaving is almost basically scraping lines on these particles to increase their surface area. Really, I couldn't believe what I was seeing and I wish I had more time and a better overall process to get more scientific data. Let me know in the comments if this is something you would like to see in the future, as the amazing researchers who joined me to look at this at Hertfordshire Uni seemed like they would be very excited about working together more in the future to do coffee projects together. But anyway, here's what I'm currently concluding about selecting coffee grinder burrs from what I saw under a microscope. So when you look at a burr, what do you see? Just a round shape with some fins on it. But to figure out what they do, you have to look closer at the three or in some cases four stages of grinding done by flat burrs and what each of those stages is actually designed to do. Each one will break down beans into different kinds of particles. The first breaking of beans isn't present in all the grinders and that's the pre-breaking phase which is done by augers or feeders in certain grinders like the Matsophilos and the Turin DF83V that I had in for my test but also things like the Zerno Z1, Time War Sculptor series and upcoming Buku Moto 80 which I'm hoping to get a hold of for a review. I'm going to call this stage pre-breaking and save stages 1, 2 and 3 for the burrs themselves. What an auger does is to pre-crack the beans with blunt pressure so they're in smaller pieces by the time they reach your grinder burrs. Without an auger, basically whole beans approach the entrance of the flat burrs, which are sort of tapered from wide enough to let the beans in to small enough to only let the grind size you want to escape out the side and into your catch cup or port filter. With an auger, these initial pieces are smaller and so it requires less crushing power from the burrs themselves to break into smaller pieces and so can be more uniform and easier to crush. So why does this matter? Well, if you have very large and intact beans going into the burrs, then the burrs pressure on them needs to create what's called a brittle failure. That means it exerts enough pressure on the bean to make the structure crack in semi-predictable ways. I talked about this in my slow feeder and slow presso videos, but this is one of the reasons why slow feeding has such a big impact on grinds, because fewer beans going in allows the full weight and force of the grinder burrs to be exerted and cause more brittle failures much more quickly. Which brings us on to stage one of the burrs themselves, the innermost ring. This section is generally designed to crush beans and in grinders that have augers to also crush up the pieces of broken up beans. But you see very different structures in different burrs. For example, here in the multi-purpose burrs, the blades come all the way to the middle ring at a shallow angle. And on these Lebru Espresso burrs, the blades don't even start until halfway up the first stage or onto the second stage. So why is that? Well, at this stage, the movement and rotation of the beans is optional. Crushing will create more irregular shaped particles and the theory behind multi-purpose burrs having ridges or blades all the way to the beginning is that it'll shave, roll and tumble the grinds into more regular shapes. At least that's what those blades partially do because really they're just crushing with more steps as all of this is basically crushing. And the results under the microscope would certainly support that. The particles here were much more uniform in their shapes than something like the DF83V which had more angular and irregular shapes. And this makes sense, right? It's like looking at the difference between being crushed by a thousand swords or being crushed by a thousand battering rams. You'll get smaller, but in a very different way. Long fins also have a slower feed rate, which leads to a more prolonged grinding process. This will take longer, but it also subjects the coffee grinds to more crushing, shaving and rolling as they migrate from stages one to two and three. So then the second stage is what I'll call the refining stage that changes the shape into a closer corollary of what the architects want to have coming out of the grinder in the end. Lots of thin blades like the multi-purpose burr will make the shape more regular, reducing the surface area and therefore making the coffee extract at a slower rate. Now on these very interesting Lebru Lab Sweet burrs, there are notches around the stage 2 section which looks like it's there to rotate the bean particles to prevent the grinds turning into flat plane like shards that slip through. A plane can then potentially be flipped and then shredded by the blades in the surrounding section so you get fewer flat planes. 
but what I saw under the microscope was really interesting. The grinds actually had very high surface area, as if they'd been scratched on their surface all the way through. Compare this to the SSP high uniformity burrs, where you see a lot more specks, with the main problem being the agglomeration of particles together into clumps. They are very, very different shapes, which would help explain the massive difference in flavour profile. The SSP HU burrs favour very high clarity, whereas the lab sweets, as the name would suggest, enhance sweetness, although I've found that it's got a lot smaller window of precision when it comes to dialing in perfectly for espresso. So then next is the third stage, which I would call the finishing stage. This is the outermost ring, usually no more than two or three millimetres, and that's the last point of contact between the coffee grinds and the grinder burrs. So obviously there's not any more grinding after that, so this is the closest that the burrs will be. And the differences here have the smallest contact time with the coffee grinds. They're designed mainly to ensure a more even particle size, so the main difference I've seen with the burrs is the length of the final edges. These brew burrs for the DF83V are a great example. Very long chevrons with hard ridges, probably designed to lower surface area by rounding off coffee grinds with a bit of blunt force. Now, when it comes to flavour, more evenness in the particle size and shape will lead to a more distinct flavour because the particles will be extracted at a similar speed. Think of boiling a pot of potatoes. If they're all different sizes, then the smallest bits will turn into mush, while the big bits will still be a little bit hard on the inside. The same thing happens with coffee. When hot water meets the grinds, you'll get fully extracted fine bits that basically have little to no coffee juice to squeeze out, and then the bigger chunks that aren't fully extracted. And in the same way, this adds texture to your coffee. Just like how some people like lumps in their potatoes, just like mama used to make, some people prefer a thicker, textured coffee rather than one with sharp clarity and distinctness of flavour. Sometimes that muted softer flavour is more pleasant for certain coffees. So those are the four stages. You've got pre-breaking, which crushes the beans into smaller bits to normalise the feed rate. Then you've got the inside stage one of the burr crushing and chopping, the middle part of the burr shaving and refining and also crushing, and the outside of the burr finishing, aka lightly crushing the grinds. The process of making something this big into something this big is not simple, and coffee is so incredibly sensitive because of this tension between size, shape, and the water pressure in such a tiny particle. So here are the things that I'm concluding from this for now. As always, I'm open to being wrong, and I'd be happy to duke it out in the comments. It seems to me that shallower blades increase the rolling of the grinds, so less angular shapes, but maybe some more scratching, which can increase the surface area, leading to faster extraction and more intensity of flavour. You can see that in the difference in the shapes between multi-purpose burrs and something like the SSP burrs, which have much deeper grooves. Personally, I found things like the Hypernova, the SSP High Uniformity, and the Labru Lab Sweet burrs the most interesting for espresso, with a good amount of clarity and sharpness without veering into something too sharp to drink. I have never liked multi-purpose burrs. For me, they create a muddy taste with espressos that muddles up flavours altogether, so I end up getting glimpses of the flavour I'm extracting, but never enough to truly enjoy them. I've tried various conical burrs and have never liked them either. They taste flat and boring, and I don't need the extra texture, it's the flavour I want and conical burrs seem to usually mute most of the flavours, making a more generic coffee-like drink. That's why I focused on flat burr geometry in this video, because I don't own many conical burrs and don't like them very much. If any manufacturers have a conical burr that you think will blow me away, please get in touch. Now, I am hoping that the conical burrs I saw at Matza's booth at Host Milan this year get put into a home grinder someday soon. I talked to one of the engineers at Matza, and it looks like they're trying to create some kind of hybrid between the conical burr and the flat burr, with more cutting blades on both edges. But of course, you do have to take any pronouncements from coffee grinder burr manufacturers with a pinch of salt, because they are trying to sell you stuff after all. But as with all these grinder burrs, a big problem remains to be alignment. If your burrs aren't aligned, you get oversized and undersized grinds, and unfortunately, the larger the burrs are, the bigger this problem becomes. So for example, if you compare 53mm burrs to 83mm burrs, just a 0.05 degree misalignment would lead to a 26.5 micron difference in the 53mm burrs, but a 41.5 micron difference in the 83mm burrs, which is 57% greater. 26.5 microns will definitely taste different, but 41 will be a whole other kind of coffee. Randomness might make an amazing first shot, and then the next shot would be absolutely rubbish with all the same settings. So make sure you align your grinders, folks. I'm not going to get into coatings here because this is already a pretty complex video and I haven't had much time to test this. It's something I'd like to study in the future, but I think the main effect happens over time with the hardness of the blades. The softer and weaker the metal, the easier it is for it to become dented, scratched, and more uneven. 
This might explain why I had such a crappy time with the Timor Sculptor 078S prototype they sent me. The Burr's metal was soft, explaining why the grinds were more consistent after 5 kilos of seasoning. So definitely hardness of burr materials and coatings are going to be a big thing going forward, so I'll make a video about that when I have time to really dig deep into this and understand it well enough to explain it. So I hope you found this video useful for choosing your next burrs, and please let me know in the comments which burrs you've tried and what they tasted like to you, and what you'd like to learn about the rapidly changing technology of grinder burrs. And also please like this video and share it with your espresso nerd friends. You can also buy my brew ledger to keep track of your favorite coffee settings so you dial in faster and never lose your settings, even when you're switching between beans a lot like I do. Thank you so much for watching you wonderfully overcaffeinated people and I'll see you on the next one.